Let's turn back to Ephesians chapter 2 to continue our consideration of this mighty epistle with the church of Ephesus. And we're about to look at verses 11 to 13. If you want to read those for me, please. Ephesians 2, 11 to 13. Reconciled to both God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. 
And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Thank you very much. Mm. Now the basis or the reason why these strangers become friends and, and, and uh, fellow believers and brethren who can fellowship together is because Jesus Christ is our peace. A very strong statement indeed. It doesn't simply say that he makes me but he, but he is our peace. In what way is Christ our peace? How does it become our peace in he himself? If we have his life within us, then we no longer have the old man within us. That enmity against God, against God's character is gone. Right. Yeah, that's, that's quite right. Now, back then there were Jews and Gentiles, physically or nationally, which, and they hated each other very, very deeply and vehemently. The Jews hated the Romans, the Romans hated the Jews, and, uh, and so on. Now, what was the real root of their hatred? Pardon? What was in them? Right, what was in them. While they had in them the enmity against the law of God, Naturally, of course, they hated one against the other, even though neither of them had the law of God in their hearts. They still hated each other with an implacable hatred. Now, when men sign a peace treaty, how much real value is there in them as signed by worldly people? Not much at all, as, as, as has been proved over the past 50 years or more, when treaties have been torn up and nations which made treaties have gone to war against each other. But when Jesus Christ is implanted in the hearts, then he, he, he is peace wherever he is, there was peace in our hearts, and consequently all those within, within whose hearts that peace is found naturally have peace with each other. That's why Paul says he is our peace, he himself is our peace. That's a very comforting fact because um, it's good to know when Jesus Christ abides in the heart, we do have that peace which passes all understanding and can, be, can remain peaceful under the worst possible kind of circumstances. And so he's made both one, has broken down the middle wall or division between us. Having a voice in his place, the enmity, that is, that is the law of Christ and ordinances, so as it created in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. Now when did Christ abolish in his place the law of Christ and ordinances? Christ. At the crucifixion, right? Now, what is this law of commandments and ordinances? Works of the flesh. Yes, it's the ceremonial law, isn't it? So it's the works of the flesh? Well, it's a law, a law of commandments that contain ordinances. It's also the law of sin and death, which would be the broken law. It would have to be more than the, uh, just the ceremonial law by itself, because... Um, no, I never intended the ceremonial law to be something that should be enmity between man and God. Right, right so it had become that. In order to them trying to obtain righteousness by their own works through that system. Right, so, so it, it, it had become an enmity, right? Okay. It was never designed to be such. God never intended to be such. It had become, it become that. Now to confirm it, let's go to 2 Corinthians 3, verse 3 for a moment. And uh, uh, I'll just you take Galatians 3, 19, first of all, to was at this point. Where Paul talks about the Ten Commandments in the same terms. Galatians 3, verse 19, let someone read it for me, please. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgression. Until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Good. Now, to what law does Paul there refer? Moral law. The moral law given on Mount Sinai, which was <coughs> added because of transgressions and became the schoolmaster to the leaders to Christ, as you read in verse 24, is it the same chapter? Yes. 23 and 24. But before faith came, we were kept under God by the law kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. That after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. Good. 
Now, God gave the thing from us written upon two tables of stone as a tutor or a schoolmaster bring us to Christ. Uh, but, when, but when we arrive there, we don't, no longer need that tutor or schoolmaster. Now, had the Jews in Christ and Paul's day turned that law into a yoke of bondage? Yes. Was it, was it fulfilling the purpose God sent in, in, in the world to fulfill? No. No, it wasn't. It changed, it changed from a blessing to a curse. Back to 2 Corinthians 3, 3 now for a moment to follow this point through. So let me read verse 1 to 3, please, first of all. 2 Corinthians 3, verses 1 to 3. Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or do we need, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. Mm -hmm. So in verse 3, Paul talks about two manifestations of God's law. And what were those two manifestations? One with the ink, the other written where? On the heart. One the letter of the law, the other the actual spirit and life of the law. Now, this distinction must be kept very clearly in mind if we wish to understand what Paul talked about in Ephesians and also again in Galatians. Let's go a little further now and read verse 4, 5, and 6. We have such trust through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also has made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills, the spirit gives life. Thank you very much. Now Paul says if you made a minister of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, why? The letter killed, but the spirit gives life. Okay? So Paul had been emancipated from the old system of preaching the letter of the law which killed and did not bring life and blessing to those who sought to obey or to gain righteousness thereby. Now finally, let's read from verse 7 down to verse um, 13. <laughs> But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory is passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect, because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech, unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. Thank you very much. And once again, Paul is contrasting the ministry of death and the ministry of life, the glorious ministry and the more glorious ministry. And very obviously, of course, the glorious ministry of that which was written on two tables of stone and served a purpose for a limited period of time namely of course to bring them tutorially to Jesus Christ as a schoolmaster and to reveal to them their undone condition and the need of a saviour in other words the table of stone were a picture of the people to whom they were given a people who had hearts of stone but on which hearts of stone were written the letter of the law the knowledge of what God required and that picture of them was designed to show them what they needed to discard that heart of stone and receive a new heart altogether, namely a living heart of flesh which could respond to the commands of God and love even as he loved. Now, when you find, as we do in the Adventist Church today, for instance, that the law is upheld to model what people are to be, and this, of course, is not the, not the purpose which the, which the Lord caught, uh, put was the Lord in place. I said again, when they church a holy for the people, the tables of stone as a model that they had a copy, this is a perversion of God's purpose in that law. And that which is designed to be a blessing becomes instead of a curse. Because when when you behold, you, you are changed into the same likeness as which you behold. <clears throat> and you become even more stony hard than before when the stony when the stony law becomes a model of your behaviour. Now, the schoolmaster is for us, is he not? Is the schoolmaster a blessing? Yes. Most definitely, he's a blessing. 
But when the law ceases to be a, a school must become an object of emulation, it becomes what? Something against us and which is a curse and a detriment to our experience. So a perverted law bit that <coughs> the moral of the story the law then is a is a curse and which is against us and must of course be taken out of the way completely. Come back to Ephesians a moment now and see how this principle applies in the same situation. <coughs> now, by the time Christ came to this earth, what had happened to the ceremonial law? Had it been perverted? Yes. Moved in its rightful place? Misused? Was it deceiving the people? Certainly. It was against in every sense of the word because of the perversion of this glorious provision which God had made for them. When Christ came to the temple for the first time, <coughs> and saw the suffering lamb he began to see in that suffering lamb a picture of his own mission and his own ministry and what did the people say the way to continue sin right the way to continue sin become a cloak or a covering for their sinfulness right so therefore that law had become something against them and not for them it become a misleading factor in their lives it become a, 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 a instrument in Satan's hands to destroy them now, when that situation arose, there was only one thing left to do that was to do away with it, which Christ, of course, did on the cross of Calvary and turned their eyes instead toward the great and glorious sanctuary up in heaven. Now, Paul realized this, of course. Let's go to Hebrews for a moment to uh, note how powerfully Paul drew upon the Old Testament sacrificial system to declare that it predicted the ministry of Christ up in heaven. Now, in the Jewish system, of course, the sanctuary is the central point of his furnishings and services. And Paul begins to look at this in Hebrews, the 8th chapter, and verse 1. I'd like to read it for me, please. Or verse 1 and 2, I should say, yeah. Now the things we have spoken, this is the Son. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty of the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. Thank you. Now, Paul is making reference, of course, to the Old Testament sanctuary, first of all, as, as the type or shadow of heavenly things, and points to Jesus Christ being the high priest of the, of the sanctuary of heaven, which was pitched by God and not by man. <clears throat> now, go to verse 4 and 5 and 6, please. Same chapter. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern shown to thee in the mount. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Thank you very much. Now, when did God say to Moses, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain? When did God say that? Well, first of all, did God say that? Did, did he? Aren't you sure? Sir, which? The question is, did God say the word, see that you make all things according to the pattern? Yes. Right, that was good. God has said that. When did God say that? To Moses on Mount Sinai with all the instructions for the building of the temple. Right. And did Moses and the people exactly carry out God's word? Yes. Precisely. Let me get Desire of Angels again and uh, we'll get confirmation of that. We use page 208, if I remember correctly. Page 208, Desire of Ages. And with great exactness, the. Um, Instructions of God was carried out by, the, by Moses and the people in the building of the sanctuary and the establishment of, of the sacrificial system. Right, start on the bottom of the page. When Moses was about to build the sanctuary. So I'm going to When Moses was about to build the sanctuary as a dwelling place for God, he was directed to make all things according to the pattern shown him on the mount. Moses was full of zeal to do God's work. The most talented, skillful men were at hand to carry out his suggestions. 
Yet he was not to make a bell, a pomegranate, a tassel, a fringe, a curtain, or any vessel of the sanctuary, except according to the pattern shown him. God called him into the mount and revealed to him the heavenly things. The Lord covered him with his own glory, that he might see the pattern, and according to it all things were made. So to Israel, whom he desired to make his dwelling place, he had revealed his glorious ideal of character. The pattern was shown them in the mount when the law was given from Sinai, and when the Lord passed by before Moses and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands and forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Exodus 34, 6 and 7. Thank you very much. Right, now this statement makes it very clear, clear then that God was the architect of the sanctuary buildings, correct? God was the architect. And the builders were Moses and the people. They had to pay the closest attention to every detail in that sanctuary, even a tassel and a bell and a pomegranate, every last little detail must be made exactly as God directed it should be made, right? Now, did they carry out the way as God directed them? Precisely. So how much how much participation does Satan have in the architecture of the sanctuary? Yeah. None at all. He was completely and totally excluded. This was entirely and only from God and nowhere else but him. Now it doesn't mention the sacrificial system in this particular paragraph, but very obviously of course what was the sanctuary without the sacrifices? Nothing. There'd be the building and the services of the building in order to reveal the plan of God to save mankind. So then, when God said to Moses, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown to you in the mound, they did just that, and God was the sole architect of the building and of its services, while Moses the people built the building according to God's plan. Now, come on a little bit further now to chapter 9, and we'll, 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 we do find that Paul begins to talk in terms of uh, sacrifices and furniture and so forth in the sanctuary building. Let's take first chapter 9, verse 1 to 5, please. Yes. Chapter 9, verse 1 to 5. Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part, in which was the lampstand, the table, and the sugar, which was called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, and behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, which had a golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold in which were the golden pot that had manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these we cannot now speak in detail. Paul, he described very briefly and, and uh, adequately the two, two apartments in the same, the holy place and the most holy place, with the appropriate furnishings. And we, of course, are quite familiar with that, so I shan't take on detail. Now let's go to verses 6 down to verse... Uh, Eight, where we find that the two apartments each had their own special list of services. Now when these things had been thus prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. But unto the second part, the high priest went alone, once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins, and in an ignorance, the Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. So there were two services, the valley and the yearly, combined to give the people total deliverance from their sin, follow and fit them for the kingdom. Well, we recognize, of course, that the actual sanctuary itself, the Old Testament sanctuary itself did not have that power, but reveal and to forgive the work of Christ in the sanctuary above. Now, verse 9 then and 10 indicates that all this is a type or a symbol of something better yet to come. Verse 9 and 10, please. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. Concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances and clothes until the time of reformation. Good, so Paul there talks in terms of a counterpart or antitype appearing, which would, which would be revealed by the Old Testament services and the building in which those services were conducted. Now in verses 11 to 15, we find that Jesus Christ fulfills that role, not the blood of goats and calves, but his own blood. 11 to 15, please. 
But Christ came as high priest of good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made of man, that is, not of this creation. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all and obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of the heifer, sprinkled, uh, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death and for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Very passionate over verse uh, 23, pick up the verse 23 the end of 48. Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy place, places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. He then would have had to suffer once since the foundation. He then would have had to suffer once, to suffer often, I beg your pardon, since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. Mm -hmm. Now Paul certainly says for the true purpose of God in the sanctuary service in these verses. A purpose which is perverted by the Jewish people, of course, and as I said yesterday, every time that the Jews apostatize, what does Satan certainly do? He cast down the sanctuary and takes away the daily services in that sanctuary. Let's come back then to verse 11 and uh, 12. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made of hand, that is not of this creation. Which tabernacle is obviously being referred to there? The heavenly. The heavenly. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but his own bloody in the most holy, most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Now, Jesus Christ obtained eternal redemption upon the cross, but he must minister that from the heavenly sanctuary in order for us to be saved. Let's go to Hebrews 7.25 to confirm that point. Hebrews 7, verse 25, some other reading, please. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Thank you. He is able to save to the uttermost. Why? because he ever lives to make intercession for them. The ministry of Christ in the most holy place is just as needful for our salvation as was his death upon the cross. I'd like to read that to you from Great Controversy where the point is made very clear and plain. Um, it's about page 490 or thereabouts, I do believe. It makes it clear that Christ mediates is just as necessary. What Christ obtains upon the cross in our ministers from the sanctuary up in heaven.
therefore not even the first coming with Deca without blood at whose command? Ask at whose command? God's command. Right. Now that's, that's confirmed in the next two verses. Let's read verse 19 and 20 someone, please. 19 and 20? Yeah. When Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Thank you very much. Now, I said this was confirmed the point of God that uh, gave the command. And Moses said, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. So at whose command did they sanctify the blood? God's, God's command. Right. In verse 23, we find now a contrast between the earthly and the heavenly sanctuary. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Good. The very part of the scripture this one because it confirms that sin actually is taken into the sanctuary up in heaven. Now, therefore, it was necessary that the copies of things in heaven should be purified with these. What does the word these refer back to? The earthly, the better things. Or the blood of wolves and goats. Does it not? Yes. Right. But the heavenly things themselves are better sacrifices than these. Which is the better sacrifice? Christ. Christ sacrifice. Now in the Protestant world, there's great difficulty in fact uh, they find it impossible to believe that sin actually goes into the heavenly sanctuary and becomes it therefore becomes unclean. But uh, this verse confirms, of course, that the heavenly sanctuary must be purified with better sacrifice than these. Now, do you clean the cleansed? Or, or do you clean the clean? Or do you clean the unclean? The dirty or the, or the business first? So that when the heavenly sanctuary had to be cleaned, what must it first have become? Polluted. Polluted or unclean. And... Uh, there's no question about that, but literally the heavenly sanctuary does become unclean by what? The presence of confessed sin, which is stored there in the sanctuary until the great day of final atonement, when the most holy place and the holy places are cleansed from sin, which is then placed upon the scapegoat or back upon the sin as the case may be. Now, does the Old Testament sanctuary type, which was so precisely ordained by God and designed by God, does it teach that the sanctuary itself becomes unclean? Well, let's yes. think about it for a moment. When a person in the encampment became conscious of a personal sin and realized that sin in him was an uncleanness in him, and when that person came to the door of the sanctuary, the sin came along with him, did it not? Right. And when he confessed over the head of the victim the sin which he committed and uh, called upon God to forgive that sin, confessing about what he was, <coughs> what he had done, and the blood was taken into the, into the first apartment. By this means, the sin was, through the blood, transferred to the sanctuary. Let's go to page 4 and 8 in the book Great Controversy to confirm this point, which is very much at the heart of the message we teach and believe today. Page 4 and 8 in the Great Controversy. Right, uh, the paragraph begins, the ministration of the earthly sanctuary consists of two divisions. The ministration of the earthly sanctuary consisted of two divisions. The priests ministered daily in the holy place, while once a year the high priest performed a special work of atonement in the most holy, for the cleansing of the sanctuary. Day by day the repentant sinner brought his offering to the door of the tabernacle, and placing his hand upon the victim's head, confessed his sins, thus in figure transferring them from himself to the innocent sacrifice. The animal was then slain without shedding of blood, says the apostle, there is no remission of sin. The life of the flesh is in the blood. Leviticus 17, 11. The broken law of God demanded the life of the transgressor, the blood representing the forfeited life of the sinner whose guilt the victim bore was carried by the priest into the holy place and sprinkled before the veil behind which was the ark containing the law that the sinner had transgressed. By this ceremony, the sin was, through the blood, transferred in figure to the sanctuary. Thank you. 
Here's the pictures of the actual transfer of sin from the sinner to the sacrifice to the sanctuary. And it's laid out in this paragraph. The sinner came before the door of the tabling and placed his hand upon the victim's head and confessed his sin, thus in fear, transferring them from himself to the sacrifice. And let's bear in mind what we've done to figure back that he's done in reality in the heavenly sanctuary. And this find in the which says that uh, uh, somewhere here on the page, yes, page 420, the, the last, second last paragraph, such was the form and so on. Such was the service performed unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. And what was done in type in the ministration of the earthly sanctuary is done in reality in the ministration of the heavenly sanctuary. Thank you. And note those words. What was done in type in the ministration of the earthly sanctuary is done in reality in the ministration of the heavenly sanctuary. So that uh, when back there the sinner placed his hand upon the victim and said he confessed his sins over the victim, there was a typical action upon his part, which is done then with then and now symbolise the actual transfer of the sin and the sins of the, to the victim, right? We must, we must recognise the type man above and the and the reality versus the uh, ceremonial. The next step was that the sinner killed the lamb with his own hand, signifying the fact that we are the slayers of Jesus Christ in reality. Then the blood representing the forward life of the sinner was carried to the holy place of spirit called the veil. And by this ceremony, the sin was through the blood transferred in figure to the sanctuary. Whereas, of course, in the New Testament situation, done actually in the case where we truly confess, confess the person. So that um, the, the sanctuary does become the part of the actual presence of the sin which was previously in us, right? And it's transferred there by the ministry of blood in part of the Old Testament sanctuary, of course, and the end of time today in respect to the New Testament sanctuary. Now, we were in verse 23 in Hebrews chapter 9, and uh, the rest of the, rest of the uh, chapter, chapter deals with Christ's ministration in the heavenly sanctuary along the same lines. Now, that was a very beautiful and wonderful gospel revelation to those people then and to us today. I ask you very simply and plainly, how can, how can we today know where Christ is, what he's doing without the sanctuary service and, and his and sacrificial system? How can we know? We couldn't. We would, we, would be, we would be deprived of a truth which is vital for our present and eternal welfare. We, we'd be lost, completely lost without that knowledge and, and light because we must enter with Christ into the most holy place of the sanctuary and by faith be with him there if we are to receive the atonement and finally be saved. But, tragically, all this became perverted. And who was the author of this perversion? The Satan loved the sacrificial system. <coughs> he hates it. Because he recognized that in that is the revelation of Christ and his salvation. And therefore Satan implacably hates the sacrificial system. And that's why every time that Israel was overthrown by our enemies, the sacrificial sacrifices were term terminated until they repented, repented and came back into God's grace again. Come back to Ephesians now, the third, second chapter, verse 14 or 15. And um, we look at this expression, the law of commandments contained all the ordinances which was against us. Now, I say again that the law of ordinances as given by God was not against anybody, except of course the enemy of truth and his followers. When Israel perverted that law, until it became a perversion of the truth and a darkness instead of light. It certainly was something which was terribly against them, and which Christ did away with when he died upon the cross of Calvary. So not in its original pure form as God gave it on Mount Sinai to Moses and the people of Israel. Now Christ did this so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. Now, basically, the two the two men brought into, into union with the Jew and the Gentile, but the union of the Jew and the Gentile was but a type of the union between God and man. Uh, I'll just to play a little diagram on the board, please. Yeah, yeah. 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 I've got it 
appreciate the statement by Paul in regards to the incarnation of Jesus Christ because it does beautifully illustrate the union between God and his people. So first of all, let me place God at the top of the page as a great source of life and everything else. Jesus Christ is a great connector and man as the dependent receiver. Now Jesus Christ has the life of God and he also has the life of man. So that in him we find two joined together, God and man. So Christ is the life of both the Father and also the created being. Can you all see this now from over here? So this circle symbolizes the life of God. This circle symbolizes the life of man. And Christ is in both circles. He's both man and God who made in himself of two. And the God and man, one new man, thus making peace between God and man and between Jew and Gentile. Right. And this certainly pictures to my mind the incarnation of Jesus Christ in a very beautiful and graphic form and shows how we can become one member or the members of one family in the family in heaven and on earth. Sometimes about time, I guess, and the pause at this point, surely. So, so let's close the thought then, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, in this case, between God and man, and between man and man as well. Time has gone, so if you have any questions or observations, we'd be glad to discuss them at this point. Yes? So, um, how do you address uh, E.J. Wagner's confessions, uh, where he uh, says that sin was swallowed up in the life of Christ, and that there's no sanctuary in heaven, and that uh, Christ is the true sanctuary, etc., etc.? What would you do like that? He wrote uh, in his, um, I think it's called his confession. Final uh, word. Pardon me? Final word confession. It's uh, Wagner's yeah. confession, I think is what it's called. When you, when you die? Uh, no, it's a letter he wrote to a man just before he died. Uh, Would you like to see it? It sounds like he lost it too, doesn't it? Yeah, I would say. It sounds like, yeah. I'm not going to judge him, but... Uh, no, oh, well, maybe you rather read the book or first. It's a short pamphlet. Read it first and then. I haven't seen it. Okay. But uh, it doesn't sound too much. Yes. In a sense, um, any command of God um, is reacted upon by the flesh as an ordinance and is attempted to be kept by the flesh as a work to obtain righteousness. So that even ordinances like baptism. The Lord's Supper and so on can be classed as um, laws that were abolished at the cross if they are kept in the sense of works of right. righteousness. That's quite right. Righteousness. Yeah, good point. Good point. Okay. Any further questions? Yes. Um, if you do something wrong, right, and then Christ shows you, right, then if you give it to him right away and ask him to take it out of you, is that a sin? Uh, because you and didn't know about it. Temptation. You did that wrong, did you say? No. But you didn't you know about it. Okay, you have something in you, right? Mm -hmm. And you didn't know about it, and then God chose you, and you give it to him right away. Oh, you've got a good question now. Uh, secret sins or hidden sins are covered by the blood of Christ, like, uh, like curiously, and, and it is as if they weren't there. When they're shown to you, and you confess them, do it right away, there's no question against you at all. Okay, so we can make an end of sin, and then if God shows us something uncovered, and we give it to him right away, then that's not counted as a sin. That's right. Okay. Very good. Okay, let's take a break. Let's take a break for a few minutes. Let's take a break for a few minutes.